dialogue requires a lot of presence. It requires for you to be very present in your body and aligned with, with your heart. It requires a lot. And at the same time, it also requires some, some notion of letting go, of letting go of control. You could say it requires a lot and at the same time it requires nothing. Hello and welcome back to the White Room. Uh, today is Monday, the 3rd of May and uh, we are in different time zones. Uh, I say hello to Mariah in Amsterdam. Hi, Simon. In Amsterdam, it's eight o'clock and four minutes. Is it true? You are completely right. <laughs> I'm completely at the and utterly right. <laughs> like last week, I'm broadcasting from... A Equ rare thing. <laughs> like last week, I'm broadcasting from Ecuador, from uh, south of Ecuador, actually, Vilcabamba, which is near Loja, uh, more or less halfway from the Altiplano th to the jungle. So more or less tropical, but not so hot. And uh, I'm here because of some private reasons. <laughs> and uh, now second time in the White Room, Ecuador. And here it is actually one o'clock and five minutes now. Today we have a special episode. This is your little feuilleton of theater podcast. Feuilleton means, of course, that we can discuss everything, all and everything here that we want. That is related to what we like, what we are, what are our burning questions. And um, today is a special episode because this is a podcast, and the podcast is about talking to each other. The motto of this podcast is, or was from the beginning, no theater in times of COVID-19. What can we do if we cannot do? We can at least speak. Um, Of course, when I say we can at least speak, it means that it's a, it's a kind of qualification when I say that. It means theater or doing theater would be better, <laughs> but we cannot, so we can at least <laughs> speak. So there's a kind of, a, you know what I mean? A kind of a qualification that in this, that I say speaking is good. It's not the best, but it's good. And... Uh, We, I remember in our first episode, we were speaking about these things whereof we cannot speak uh, a lot also. So this paradox of wanting or of normally doing things on the stage, that means in a, or yeah, in, on the screen, it can also be, but doing things, doing actions, images, performing and uh, we are speaking about this practice which is not real which which we cannot realize at the moment in this podcast mm. speaking about something that we normally have to do and uh, <laughs> and this this kind of strange st struggle um, philosophically let's say is um, is mm. uh, part of this podcast that is why Or in, and maybe in the best sense, what we can do in this, in this form is having a dialogue. But what does it mean to have a what? dialogue? <laughs> and uh, that is why... Can I just note something, Simon? Yeah, uh, I, before I just... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just I say that's why today we have some help um, who I want to introduce after your little in-between. Please. Inter I just uh, realized when you were saying what we do in the white room, speaking about theater, that there is actually an interesting thing that some might say speaking about theater is as little capable of doing as theater itself, as the action of theater takes place in this strange void of the stage where nothing actually can get done. And so 
maybe we can also see it the other way around, that as theater is a powerful actor, so also speaking can be a powerful act. <laughs> yes. The, yeah. So this is the, now we laid some kind of foundation for, and I'm very happy to, to welcome an old friend of mine, with, who is uh, Breno, Breno Kashna Russo. And I said, welcome to the White Room. Welcome to Breno, who is in Lissabon. Thank you, Simon. It's a great pleasure to be here with you today and reconnecting after so many years and uh, to get to know Mariah as well. I'm very happy to be here speaking with you and touching base. Um, and yes, I'm in Lisbon and uh, it's uh, 7.09 right now in Lisboa and the sun is still up and it's quite warm today. Yeah, spring is coming. Spring is coming, is. summer is coming. I think <laughs> slowly it will, everything will get better. But this does not concern us today. Breno, um, so today we have a, let's say, a non-theatrical topic in this podcast. And I'm very happy because in my, in my conversations with Mariah, we touched sometimes also the topic of dialogue. And uh, I invited you here and I provoked you Uh, and maybe I in the form of an introduction, I want to be a little bit also now a little bit, how do you say, I forget, I forgot, I forget my English, uh, <laughs> a little bit blasphemous, <laughs> but uh, first, no, how, how should I start? Yeah, I would really like to, to, to start um, with that. Um, I would like to invite you to, before we dive actually into the dialogue, I would like to, to ask you to introduce yourself a little bit. Uh, I invited you here because you work, let's say I, say, I just say you work with dialogue, as far as I understood. So you uh, say dialogue is something that is, that is, uh, can be used as a tool for, yeah, for what actually? <laughs> and but as as uh, I ask you here um, now, can you maybe introduce yourself quickly and how you approached this topic or this practice um, before we actually go into a dialogue? Sure, I'll be happy to do that. Um, so um, I'm Breno, and I was born in uh, Rio de Janeiro in Brazil and um, grew up in a culturally uh, mixed uh, family, uh, my mom's family being German and my dad's uh, mix of uh, many things in Italian, Portuguese and indigenous Brazilian. And um, grew up in Rio, went to a German school. Mm, biggest uh, influences uh, in language were Portuguese and then German as a second language. And... Um, Finishing um, high school, um, I went to London, moved to England, and uh, went to an uh, arts university. And uh, from there, uh, 12 years passed, and I never really came back to Brazil. So I sticked uh, around Europe in many different countries. So started off in London, and um, then went to Sweden. Um, where I studied social entrepreneurship and met uh, Anna, who is my partner, and uh, we have a little daughter called Liv, who Simon met when she, I think when she was still in the belly, because she was born in Witten in Germany, when we were studying uh, together. Um, maybe when Simon came, she was already there. She was already there, yeah. But now she is really she was she's there. pretty and she's a young girl. How, how old is she actually now? She's 10, she's really tall and she's, uh, she's, she's um, yeah, you can't say like, it's really this phase of like leaving childhood and entering something else. Mm. And um, yeah, so Witten and uh, talking about Witten, it's a nice connection to the topic of today because this was the moment where I really touched base more with dialogue and I was introduced to dialogue 
um, in, for, in the format of uh, Bohmian dialogue that I will also introduce to you in a bit um, more uh, through a professor, a Japanese professor who Zeman also met in, uh, in Witten, Kazuma Matoba. And uh, he um, basically um, practiced dialogue in his seminars with students. And uh, this for me was really incredible because it, a lot of that just stayed with me. The format just made so much sense for a learning environment. And um, so this was the touching base with uh, this dialogical format. Um, after that, um, we did a big, big travel, uh, which uh, shaped me a lot as well towards the end of my time in, in, uh, in Witten. Um, where uh, Liv, Anna and I, we went uh, overland leaving uh, Belgium. The, this moment we were already living in Belgium. Uh, and we went all the way to Thailand overland, um, visiting many different initiatives and projects and universities along the way. And I was really curious about how students take their notes in the different universities. So this became a big project and... Um, and uh, this uh, was uh, two years of my life dedicated to that. And um, in the end of it, um, we didn't really know where to go. We were in Thailand and we didn't really have a home to go back to. And um, we, we just, um, yeah, we're fantasizing where it could go. And... Um, and we went to Belgium because my partner, Anna, she's half Belgian. And this was the easiest option uh, for the moment to figure things out. So these were two years of figuring things out in uh, Antwerp. And, um, and then um, we found home, really, I would say, in Portugal. And uh, we've been here for uh, over four years now. And um, it's a place where all our cultural baggage can find like a neutral spot to flourish so this is a bit uh, for me and um, yeah since a few years now dialogue came back into my life and it's interesting because it was completely gone after Witten for some time and then it came back and it came back very hard it just made so much sense and I was looking to the world and seeing what was happening in the world and was like okay we need to practice something like a dialogical format and um, and then I started, um, it actually, like, just briefly how it came back is also interesting because it was a friend of mine here in Lisbon who was going to have his birthday. And he said, Breno, I would like you to facilitate a session in my birthday. And I was like, okay, but like, how, what should we do really? And I, it was like, I don't know. You know, like you be there and we do something together and I want you to facilitate it. And I was like, okay, let's go. <laughs> and, um, and then I was there and it was like, I don't know, it was a big group. It was like 40 people, you know, from all different ages, his friends that were kind of like my age as well. And then his parents were there, friends of his parents, his grandma was there. So it was all these different generational layers and, um, we were a big circle and uh, we put a talking piece in the middle and uh, I introduced a little bit the notions of Bohmian dialogue and we, we spoke, we talked to each other through that and uh, it was so incredible. It was just so special and people really dove into a sphere together and um, it was like creating space and um, it touched all of us who were there. And um, from that moment on, I was like, okay, I want more of that because it just makes so much sense. And then I started uh, creating more and more of these spaces of uh, speaking with a different intention and listening with a different intention mainly. And, um, and it's from there that the idea of creating like also with COVID happening and also like you guys with theater not being able to meet in, in a space and actually doing something um, we uh, started doing um, dialogue events, but in an online uh, format. And this is how um, the format that we call Dialogues.1 
um, that also Simon participated in one of the events that used the methodology of Dialogues.1, that is a solid dialogues with the partnership of the Goethe Institute, uh, came about where we touch base with what we are going to tap into here in this format, also in the virtual sphere. So I think that's a bit about me. Wow. So interesting. Uh, Simon, I don't, I, I'm sure you have a continuation in mind, but I, I really want to respond and let Benno know that uh, with a cross-pollination group, which is a group of theater artists, we have set up a, a, a group that runs on dialogue, but then the good dialogue between practices. So we try to create a space where our theatrical track practices can dialogue with each other. And it has also uh, gone online, of course, where it is a double challenge to speak from and with the practice in this dialogue uh, uh, shape that includes the doing. And it is indeed like creating space. Absolutely agree. So, yes. Um, <laughs> I cannot refrain myself of playing the devil now a little bit. And before, <laughs> I'm really happy. We are going to have a dialogue now. But before, uh, I want to tell a small story which is I found in the book of Jean-Claude Carrière of stories. We were talking in the last episodes on him. And uh, the story goes like this. A drunk man comes to, in, in, comes to the house of Norman Vincent Peale. I don't know if you know this guy. He was the inventor of positive thinking. Do you know positive thinking? And uh, there is a guy who wrote this book, Positive Thinking. Someone invented that? Yes, there is a book. And this guy is called Norman And I Peel. call it Sky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. Exactly. And he wrote a book, Positive Thinking, something like this. So a, drunk, a drunkard comes to him and knocks on his door. And Norman Vincent Peel opens. And he says, what, what do you want? And the drunkard says... I want you to explain me what positive thinking means. And um, Norman Vincent Peale says, well, I'm very glad I would like to explain you, but maybe tomorrow when you're sober. And the drunk person says, yeah, but when I'm sober, I don't really care. <laughs> And... Uh, These feelings sometimes I have with all of these great concepts, dialogue, positive thinking, so you know. And especially when, when we say it's good for everything, no? Where, so I just wanted to put some blasphemous salt in this. But I'm very sober now and I want to uh, speak and to hear about dialogue. So I give now actually the power of this podcast to Breno. Thank you so much. I feel honored. I have the power now. So when uh, Simon was uh, inviting me to um, open up a dialogue on dialogue, um, uh, hmm. of course, one came to mind to me that is uh, David Bohm, who I already mentioned before. He brought up this uh, Bohmian dialogue. And uh, uh, Bohm is just a very interesting character because um, he was an American um, scientist. He was into physics and he was a brain from physics. And um, he, um, yeah, in this very um, scientific uh, way, he managed to... Um, research the connection between the individual and the whole and this interested him very much and um, he observed one time um, how an uh, an electron came in in uh, in in touch with plasma that is basically collective gas yeah so an electron came in touch with like this collective gas of plasma and uh, he wanted to see what happens in this encounter and um And to his surprise, 
uh, the electron became more free, became more mobile and became much more free, really, in connection to this collective. And uh, he didn't like reject the collective or became completely one with the with the plasma. He just became him. He was himself and uh, much more mobile and free. So this was the moment where Bohm had this aha, like to seeing that an individual doesn't need to leave his individuality and freedom to be part of the collective, but being part of the collective, his individuality and freedom just becomes bigger. And, um, and this uh, for him was this moment where he saw, okay, then what do we need uh, for this uh, to happen? And he came about a um, uh, method of communication. He said, okay, if these uh, electrons and all these individuals are people, we need a way to interact that this collective can be um, potentialized, the potential can be achieved. And um, yeah, so I, I find this incredible, his journey of, uh, of like um, towards the end of his career to really focus from like physics and metaphysics and then go into like a communication tool. And he really developed this basically in this little book here called On Dialogue. And, um, and it's a very short book, but uh, it gives a, a good overview of what Bohm means with this, uh, with this communication tool. And uh, right in the beginning, uh, reminded me when Zeman had this invitation, because um, this is how he starts the, the chapter on dialogue. He says, the way we start a dialogue group is usually by talking about dialogue, talking it over, discussing why we're doing it, what it means, and so forth. I don't think it's wise to start a group before people have gone into all that, at least somewhat. He was... He was uh, a theorist, and he was very much interested in the theory, but he also did it. So he got people together and, um, and was starting these dialogues, dialogue groups all over the place and really just tapping into a different form of coming together and speaking and listening mainly. And it's interesting you, you, you made this um, yeah, duality of the doing and the speaking now. So actually you want to do, but now you're speaking about the doing. And uh, I would bring another, another notion in that is listening. Um, and, uh, and dialogue as Bohm sees it, uh, for me, how I interpret it, um, has much more to do with uh, listening than with speaking. And, um, yeah, this is for me just was like, wow, okay. And, and now we listen. Okay, how, how, how do we listen? I don't think um, many people don't know. Don't know how to listen. We were not taught how to listen. And uh, if I think as well into our whole like uh, educational system, at least my, my uh, background and my educational um, path, um, we are very much taught on how to perform, how to speak, how to um, counter argument, um, but uh, not really about listening. And uh, I think this is a skill that is very, very, very much needed in our days nowadays. So maybe just before we, we go into dialogue, just some, some basic um, knowledges of the of, of the Bohmian dialogue that I'd like to give is that um, also if we look at the roots of things, so Bohm is also saying, okay, to start a dialogue group, you talk about dialogue, true dialoguing. Yeah. So he looks into the nature, the root of what dialogue is. And if we look as well, like um, it's, it's very different to what we uh, sometimes use as dialogue that has more of a debate or discussion orientation. Yeah. And, and he really looks into that. I find very interesting because he looks at discussion yeah? and how discussion etymologically comes from, from, from Latin disquatere. And disquatere, if we take that to the, to the word, it's, it, it actually means to shake apart. Yeah. So it's to look at things and take it and cut in tiny different pieces and really look down closely and then from there create an argumentation. 
Yeah. And, uh, and that's great because, well, science uses that a lot and our whole educational system uses it, but there is just a lot that misses out on it. Yeah. It brings a lot, but a lot gets left out. And basically, um, in this format of discussion, yeah, we are uh, ignited into hearing things to already reply to them. So we are already like perceiving things, what is said, and we're thinking of how will we counter argument that? Yeah? And, and this brings to this ping pong of argumentation uh, that um, becomes this uh, kind of like game, uh, competitive game, where in the end someone wins. And this is the person who has the best argument. Yeah? And um, dialogue is coming into a completely different um is coming from a completely different nature. Yeah? So dialogue is coming from dialogos, comes from the Greek, and literally means through the word. So it's, it's through the word um, something gets um, shown to two people or a group of people. Yeah? And it has a much more um, generative um, um, sense to it where the focus is not put into how to counter argument what was said, but how can I listen to that and really listen? So the focus is really on listening. And how can I then um, add something to it so it becomes something new? Yeah. So this, this notion of making, creating, creating something new is very alive in, in, in dialogue. And uh, how can I really listen to the other and together we come to something new? And um, yeah, so these are like some notions Bone brings. And then on top of that, um, also added by um, our professor Matoba, and uh, that I very much like to bring forward is three, three principles that guide the interaction. And uh, the first principle is be brief and precise. The second one is speak from the heart. And the third one is listen as you would like to be heard. And with that, I will put a seed question for us in the middle. And uh, we see where this leads. And I just ask you to really tune down to yourself and just really... Um, yeah, take a deep breath and uh, take in consideration the three principles I just mentioned and the nature of dialogue. Um, the invitation is for us to see what can be generated in between us. And uh, the question that I put down here for us is, um, when does creativity take place? This is the question for us to kickstart. The conversation does not need to be limited to it. It can go wherever we want it to go. This is just a seed planted in the middle in between us. And uh, I open the floor to all of us. I'd like to share something that has been bothering me for a long, long, long time, almost like a nightmare, that I thought, I am not creative. I have no fantasy. I can't make things up. And this was making me so scared.
I have to say that, that while Mariah was speaking, I, I observed that I was thinking about what to answer to this question all the time. <laughs> so I want, I want to come up with something really original or uh, good, you know. I want to answer this question, what, when does creativity really, or when does it really take place? I, that was the question. And I was thinking on that question, how to respond while Mariah was speaking. So, yes, I, I heard what she was saying, but I was all the, at the same time also thinking what I would respond. <laughs> um. And I can relate a lot to what Mariah was saying, because uh, for me, it's this to to be asked the question and to have to, or not to respond like this, uh, to improvise, let's say, it's for me, um, yeah, difficult because I want to be, I want, I would like myself to be inventive, creative, uh, full of fantasy, but this, I cannot really turn it on like with a switch. It's sometimes it's, happens not when I would or not when I'm for, not when I'm pressured to do it or when I pressure myself but uh, in other moments these other moments are usually also reacting maybe to some other to some other impulse that is coming to another person proposing something or also in those rare moments when you can actually daydream, which is also very seldom because I tend to fill my day not with dreaming but with stuff like, <laughs> like uh, watching some video or reading or listening to podcasts too much <laughs> as so far that I uh, uh, and somehow I don't know why my brain wants this it's really addicted to input mm. and this so there is a big horror of the void that is left when there is no input but when there is actually no input then after some time it can also happen that there comes an idea or something, no? Something new pops up, maybe running through the woods or something. And this is always the worst time because then you cannot write it down or something. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's, it's quite interesting because hearing Mariah and uh, hearing you, Simon, um, how I relate, I relate to it uh, uh, quite a bit of what was shared. And um, what, what I grasp from it is, is, yeah, just opening up beyond this space of pressure. And I connect pressure to also fear um, that Mariah um, shared. And you also mentioned, Simon, about like, these moments happen when you are not pressured by it, where you, when you're not really wanting it to happen. And um, yeah, it just makes me think of these spaces. What are these spaces where we are actually, yeah, not pressured, where we are, we have the, the, the space to daydream. Like what are the qualities of these spaces? And what do they ignite in us? Mm. That's, I like this question. What are the qualities of these spaces that ignite us? <laughs> so... Um, I, 
I would say that I, yes, I have in my memory, I have some experience of places. This is not meant uh, that it's somewhere. It's just uh, in time and space. Moments uh, where creativity happened or where something new happened. And I have to say, it's not an easy like recipe or not an easy mixture for recipe to to say it was that and that and that. But what quality was it? It, for me, um, hmm. <laughs> it has a quality of surprise. So something really creative is something which surprises you. Which you maybe even want to correct in the first place. It surprises you. It's something maybe you rehearse something and something goes wrong. Or this anecdote of a Louis Buñuel shooting a movie and there was an airplane was a movie that was set in the Middle Ages, but then there was an airplane flowing, <laughs> flying, and he said, "Take, film it, shoot it." <laughs> <laughs> and then in the film there was an airplane. <laughs> so take these, take these accidents that happen, and maybe use them to your, to your advantage. Use them. Be open to the possibility that these accidents can lead you to something new. In the same time, I feel that maybe it's not only about not having pressure, because um, maybe I also need some kind of, of pressure or not, I don't know. But it is, for me, the most creative moments were uh, like a very fine or very complex uh, dynamic between something that was prepared, something rehearsed, something that was something that I wanted to show or to, 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 to produce pressure in the situation that there was somebody also looking uh, or so it was not only me it was not only it was also somebody else or other people and at the same time something that some kind of attention that was more that was a, some kind of flow maybe some kind of flow which was, uh, uh, yeah, which was uh, produced by all these different factors. And then, yeah, and then something happens, some kind of surprise, some kind of... And then you feel, when the surprise happens, this creative thing, then you feel, ah, no, it was something wrong, or it was something else which we did not expect. And then, to observe this and to let it happen. Yeah, so... Yeah, I don't know. I shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I really like something you said that stuck to me, um, Simon, is these accidents. This word just really stayed. And uh, I don't know. When I think of like the first thing when I think about an accident is like a car crash. But an accident can be so many things and it's basically if I if I just observe it for a short moment, it's just something that was not planned. Who who is going to plan a car crash, right? Like it's just something that happened without being planned. So, yeah, it's it's something. This, this flow also kind of like a resonate that you mean. And I think the flow is more what happens than when we observe the whole like 
like with a more like a bird's eye view. But the accident itself, it's like an accident is a moment. There's something that happens there in a, in a trigger of a moment. And uh, something turns and, and then flow get ignites. Yeah. I, I love the, the word accident. Uh, and I, I immediately consider, so what do you need to have an accident? And, you know, one of the things that uh, something needs to be going on for an accident to happen, right? Some, some and the more uh, precise or consistent or, or focused this thing that is going on is, it might make the accident more uh, obvious, the more disruptive it, uh, it, it is, the more light it, uh, it shines maybe. And um, I, I connect these accidents very much in that way too. Uh, you know, in a in a in a small way to like the the things you do, and then and usually uh, the other can be the work you are doing, or it can be your partner in crime, your colleague, or the other person on the road that you don't even know <laughs> that create the accident with you. Um, yeah. So th mm -hmm. that is, I think, uh, attached. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, how, when you speak about the others, also something comes to my mind because you need some synchronicity happening between you and the other for an accident to take place and, and still like a flow to follow from that. Uh, and not this person go like, okay, I'm out, I'm out of here. You know, I'm gonna see you right right away. Um, yeah. Like some synchronicity, some form of theatrical performance, some form of play needs to be happening in 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 between the the, the subjects, let's say, um, for for this uh, flow to to really be generated after this car crash. I think uh, I, I there is the that, word uh, that I think what you mean is trust or confidence. I yes. don't know in German it would be Vertrauen. Uh, it is like, and this is especially now when we were speaking or for instance in the independent theater history of the late 20th century, there was hard work on constructing something new there were uh, charismatic personalities and uh, there was also sometimes um, like, yeah, there is also stories of in some moments where the director or the also she director, the directress, I don't know, but mostly directors went go too far yeah, and break this trust by abusing. In any, it can be uh, hope. It can be uh, in different ways. The trust is something very delicate, which happens. I don't think um, so much times. So it's not usual. Uh, it is more usual that you have a contract and that you know the rules, and this is also very good. And. Um, Yeah, I don't really know where I'm going with that. Maybe somebody can take up this <laughs> trust. <Okay. laughs> no, that's uh -huh. a good thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. If I speak from the heart, I think that's a great thing. I I would like to bring in my my good friend Richard Sennett, who I have never met, but who I consider one of my great companions on the road, and. And what he, he says about creativity, I think it's so beautiful because he takes it out of art or theater making or having this creative uh, idea. He puts it in the hands of the craftsman. And he says uh, that 
great creativity is happening in the act of repair. When there's something broke and the craftsmen have to improvise, maybe it's something that broke that have never happened before, and he has maybe not the right tools or the tools are not yet you know, used in such a way ever, then this person has to use what he or she can do, including all the bodily, the physical sensitivities of the hands and the, this feeling of knowing what, what the iron feels like when you bend it, for instance, to improvise a new solution or a new way to use the tools. And it brings creativity to a very interesting place, I think, where um, it is not mystical anymore. It is a very human act of solving and searching and, and uh, finding through uh, searching uh, physically also and through intelligence and technique. And maybe on the heels of that, uh, I can bring throw in my, another friend that I hold very close to my heart. This is Brian Eno, <laughs> who who has a similar act of making it small and saying the seed of of creation lies in these tiny things, the tiniest of acts of creation. That this may be just one note following the other. And no one would think this would become Beethoven's uh, third symphony, but it did because it's building, it's building and building. It was not ready. And, and that has, he calls it the little green chest of drawers, that little object that hides a universe uh, inside. And that was mm -hmm. a very comforting, again, a bit crafty interpretation of creativeness. That's beautiful. I love this image of the drawers, the little drawers holding the universe inside. One word that you said, Mariah, that also stayed with me is um, improvisation. And I think this is one uh, in, in my small uh, experience with theater, uh, one that was very much alive. And um, I remember these improv theater exercises where um, I liked one a lot where you were not allowed to say no or you were not allowed to, 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 to be kind of like against. It was just building up, building up, building up, building up. Everything was like building up. And, um, and because this is a... This was an exercise with pe with other people, so this was a uh, yeah interpersonal exercise. Um, it just creates a it smoothens a lot. Maybe it touches base with what Simon said as well about trust, because it it smoothens the maybe fear of rejection or someone saying no or not going with your game with you because anything you'll do will be built up upon. So the pressure is gone of this fear, at least for me in my experience, of says, uh, being said no to. And it's just like there's this other exercise that is in communication where you're not allowed to say, you know, when people go like, ah, but... And then you already know, okay, everything that was before the but doesn't matter. <laughs> the, what comes after the but is what the person actually wants to say. And, um, and, um, and there's one exercise in communication that you're, you're, you can only reply to a person by saying yes and. So this is how it goes. Yes and. So it's this building up that happens that has this playful improvisation with it that, in my experience, creates a lot of trust. Yes, you're right. Yes. Mano, but, uh, no, sorry. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say. <laughs> yes, and <laughs> I spent a lot of time in San Francisco in communities that were very immersed in conscious communication. 
and and this yes and was uh, well practiced and it it could drive us all completely insane <laughs> it's driving people in circles yes and i think that the trust in dialogue that's in the three principles listen like you would like to be heard is uh, very quite a bit similar to yes and and the, and to speak from the heart and be precise is be brief and precise is is also very much speaking to this can, theatrical hmm. can you repeat them actually just once breno i would like to just hear them again be brief and precise speak from the heart listen as you would like to be heard i think um that's all very good breno but not so. <laughs> no i think <laughs> I think these principles are really, really, really powerful. But, no, not but, and, <laughs> and I think that they're not easy and that they're not sentimental things. So you can listen to them in the beginning and say, oh yeah, now I feel, now I feel, Like this, like this, but already the first principle, be brief and precise. Me, I, I mean, speaking, uh, remembering how I was uh, speaking before, lost, no? Just, uh, it's very difficult to really be brief and precise to say what you want to say. This is the first thing. The second thing, what was the second thing again? I don't... I don't <laughs> Speak from speak the heart. The heart. Yes. The second thing, speak from the heart. I think this is because why it was so useful when I did this practice that you had also these papers lying around in the in the center where you could always look at them and they were like these rules hanging there because I forget. And what does it even mean to speak from the heart? I really, does it mean I have to speak like I'm feeling good or bad or uh, how was my day today? I don't think so. I think it's, <laughs> but what does it mean speaking from the heart? And the third, listening. Listening is the thing that, that already in this conversation is <laughs> what what I'm what I'm when I am honest with myself, what is the most uh, most difficult for me because all the time I'm somehow not not here. I'm either thinking of what I have said and saying, "Oh, I could have said that smarter," <laughs> or I'm already thinking ahead of how could I maybe explain more what I want. No. Mm -hmm. Would you mind if anyone else listened to you like that, Simon? But uh, I don't understand. Well, it says listen as you would like to be heard. Yes, uh, this is this is the the task, no? And I find it difficult to. To, to I, I just observe myself uh, either when you speak, for instance, either thinking back on what I have said just before and thinking, how could I say that better <laughs> because it was not good or thinking ahead. Not all the time, but a lot of the time. I, 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 I like the, the, the provocation a bit from Mariah. Um, And, and, and I think there, there's something that lies in there. Um, and how you're describing your uh, perception, Zimon, and the question is then, would you mind if another person, for example, me or Mariah in dialogue with you, if we um, would have the same perception when you are speaking, would that be okay for you? 
Um, I, now I understand it in two ways. The first thing, if I would mind that somebody, while listening to me, thinks of his own uh, or her own things, of course, no, I, I would not mind because everybody can do what, <laughs> what, 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 what they want. If, but if dialogue, um, you, okay, maybe something else. You could say these are the principles, no? But dialogue is also like, it's what happens, no? It's also one approach to say whatever happens is okay. But then I can also see that we go into a situation where we say we now have a dialogue and in the end it's just a normal conversation, just a little bit more sentimental. <laughs> because you feel good. But do you actually listen? Do you actually speak from your heart? Are you actually brief and precise? So this, maybe this auto uh, or self-observation is something which I would think, not be, not, I'm not the expert on dialogue here, but I, for me, I would think that it's important, of course, first for me personally to remember, but if we say dialogue is something that we can strive for and not, not just a title for a sentimental talk, then uh, yeah, I think it's, a, it's something that everybody should observe and should work on. No, I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> I'm thinking of the speak from the heart uh, part, <laughs> if I may rhyme, maybe onwards. And I'm thinking uh, uh, I don't uh, really connect it to uh, um, sentimentalness, this heart. I connect it to uh, really standing personally, you as a person, for what you are bringing in uh, to the space. And and another thing that I connect to it is that you're not bringing this thing in order to get that other thing. So you're not being political about it or in order to uh, provoke this person into making a mistake or to bait someone, you know, to, to show maybe more than they wish. So that's what it says to, to me. And I... I connect it to also um, a philosopher who was speaking about uh, public debate um, a po or, and uh, I can't remember the name but this, this philosopher was also saying about uh, the importance of public debate and that it only could happen in a, in a meaningful way if everyone is speaking from the heart meaning speaking from this place of not being political about it, which is rare in public, public speaking, actually. Yeah, I relate to what you say, um, Maraya. And... Uh, For me, speaking for, from the heart is also like seeing, you know, where your words are coming from. Yeah, it's um, and, and dialogue, I, I relate to it. And, and I'm not like doing it all the time. And it's it's always a practice, but I relate to it as not a process of, of the mind, a process of, of thinking. Um, hmm. And yeah, I think thought is present. It's part of it, but the engagement of opening a space of dialogue, it's not being fueled by the mind. And it's a space where yeah, we're inviting the mind to not take the stage.
there's there's a characteristic of dialogue that uh, um, that somehow the silence in between that that is just after someone has spoken becomes incredibly precious and uh, and this is I think um, speaking to what you you just brought about it not being about being very smart or clever but and and in that sense the dialogue really allows what I kind of all suspect that wisdom or or is not that the thing that was needed can come from very unexpected places <laughs> it can come from the person you least expect without them even attempting to do that and i think dialogue allows uh, for that also that unexpected things can be appearing um and also have unexpected ripples or resonances with different p- uh, people present. Yeah, totally. <laughs> one one thing that I I love about dialogue circles is when sometimes yeah you just feel like the person because now we are in in this format but when we are in a in a physical f- uh, format there is a talking piece in the center of us so for you to speak you need to walk towards it and then you need to catch it and you can speak when you have this in your hands so there is an exercise of okay, I'm going to speak, and then you walk towards it, and then you speak, and then you place it back. And um, when someone catches the word and speaks what is, in my mind, almost like entirely to the point, I'm like, okay, <laughs> I don't, it's, it's not about me. It's not about me speaking, but it's what was shared. And it can be me or it can be someone else. I think there's a... This image comes to me now of... of something we are going to build this summer i hope it's going to be a big big uh, uh you know resonate with with this dialogue so it's called the wunderkammer and things will appear as they appear as they are brought in specifically by people but not for a specific reason that to to build a car for instance but because this is thing for some reason has significance for them so will gather unexpected um, a constellation of of unexpected nature where relations are created uh, also unexpectedly and and it's just got this vision of the, the dialogue as you spoke of, uh, of almost like a wunderkammer where you know the things that are appearing in the circle uh, you might not really not know <laughs> why they should be there but they are there and and they find their relations um, in in the in this empty space maybe even this this silence Has any of you ever been to a Quaker uh, service, a Quaker gathering? Do you know how it, how it goes? It is a room with a square room and all along the sides are chairs. You go in and sit in silence until someone, might be you, but you never know, is moved to speak and then this someone stands up and speaks and uh, and the ideas that 
this person is, or the thought is that this person is moved uh, by the spirit or inspired. Inspired, exactly. Inspired, yeah. Has the spirit. Yeah, I think there is there is this notion in um, in dialogue as well. So it's a container we're doing here, and this container needs to be held. It's 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 here, and we enter it, and we're gonna leave it in a bit, and and when we're in it, it's this space of. of letting go of pressure, of really breathing. For me, like I imagine myself in like a space with like waves and, and, and breathing and the pressure is just gone. And through the pressure, pressure going away, when, when something ignites me to speak, I'll speak. And if nothing comes, it's it's not for me to speak. Mm. It puts a uh a light of of significance, even without putting pressure on the on the content. But this uh, speaking in such a space, even though there's no pressure, it's also not light. Like it does not mean nothing, because maybe it is a little related to this wunderkammer idea that. Once it's there, it's there. And um, maybe when you are in a discussion and you take a wrong, uh, you know, a wrong turn that leads nowhere, you go, oh, okay, we backpedal and pick it up over here and then we take the, dis the debate further and we will... Uh, but it's not how it works in a dialogue. Things get put in and, and they're there, I guess. And not being right or wrong, but there's still this like, yeah, I'm going to put this here, this this... There would be no sense in taking something back or backpedaling to the the last point of uh, of uh, the argument that made sense, for instance. Or be like unsinging a song. So I have one little quote here from Bohm that um, I can share with you that uh, yeah reminded me of it also connecting to what we shared and it, it touches base with thought as well. So it says, dialogue is really aimed at going into the whole thought process and changing the way the thought process occurs collectively. We haven't really paid much attention to thought as a process. We have engaged in thoughts, but we have only paid attention to the content, not to the process. So I think that is quite interesting and just by trying for me to tap into the exercise of observing thought as a process and how it takes place, it, in my observation, it already comes to, yeah, almost like a, a deconstruction of thought itself. And, uh, and it's almost like things start falling into its place in in a different way.
I want to get back from this what you now uh, say of the of the thought process to Simon's listening conundrum and 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 just note that the sparks that occur in your brain as someone speaks is exactly i think the collective uh, as uh, um belonging to this collective thinking as we listen we also catch and we also spark and pop and 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 bring something we become impregnated by the other's offerings and and this uh, birth is exactly this immanence that is hiding there, that is waiting. And even though many of these sparks cannot be shared because usually I think <laughs> that there is so much happening in us that it's always a choice what you will put, what you think will feed this uh, this moment this uh, uh, space we're building um, but that that's one for me at least one of the joys of collective thinking is how we spark each other off and uh, and even in the in the dialogue this way that it's not argumentative but kind of associative and synergetic and and uh simultaneous even it allows for a lot of sparks to happen you know they, there's so much richness also in the inexp unexpressed uh, thought unexpressed process which is great it's fine Is the is dialogue in the sense of boom, or in the sense that we were we are trying maybe to practice now? Is this something that you that that happens? Is it something that you achieve, or can you cannot achieve it, or? I'm still, I'm sometimes stuck in this paradox of on one side letting things happen, you know, letting things happen, and on the other side also distinguishing different qualities, that there is a quality of dialogue which is higher, this is like a better or a deeper dialogue than just a normal day-to-day -day conversation exchange of arguments. That's why we maybe practice it or why we think about that today or speak about that today. And um, so does this... How to formulate this... Hmm. Uh, this question, I could also say, does it get better, or does it even does it actually work? <laughs> Do you have different experiences of dialogue, or does it work, or is it for people just some kind of? I'm 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 coming back again and again on this, maybe again different dichotomy or different paradox. Is it really a dialogue that we're having, or do we just feel good? Is there is it is it is it a dialogue when you feel good, or is there some different steps to it? 
is a dialogue. Everything what happens when we say now we have a dialogue and we try. Uh, are there things as a failed dialogue, a failed dialogue that fails? So these are great questions. And, uh, you know, like when you were speaking with your question, um, there's an image that came to my mind. And, and it's a picture of a, of a sailboat. And, you know, like, there is, I, I can share my experience, and this is all I got. And, um, there's sometimes spaces that you enter that is created, commonly created, because we agreed by creating this space. So this is a common agreement between us. So we created this container. And that you, you there is this underlying agreement of, of having created that and have opening this space that creates openness and trust. And, and, and it allows for certain things to come true. And then you in your individual seat and body, your individual little boat, so to say, you can choose um, what kind of gadgets you're going to have like on your boat. Are you going to put your sail up or are you going to put your sail down? You're going to turn on the, the motor boat and like what, what are you going to do with your individual little boat in this container we opened. And um, for me, it's, it's, it's a coming together. It's, it's not completely letting go. So if you question me, like how, how is, is it dialogue? Like one that you, you steer it with your, with your steering wheel. Um, so it's not about really completely letting go and lying down on the boat, put let, letting the sail flap and just kind of like, okay, let the sea take me. For me, it's not completely that. But it's also not about just putting the motor on of the boat and going through the waves. So for me, it's more about like putting the sails up and seeing what kind of wind is there and then sensing how I'm going to position my boat in that wind and then take the, the, the wind that is collective between us and sail through that. So this is an image that came to me. So there is, there's, you know, like sometimes I think in life, everything is about, there is a level of contraction and there is a level of like, relaxation, contraction and relaxation. And, and this is like a coming together because you're, you're not, you're not just kind of like with your feet up, your very dialogue requires a lot of presence. It requires for you to be very present in your body and aligned with, with your heart. It requires, it requires a lot. And at the same time, it also requires some, some notion of letting go, of letting go of control. So there is these two kind of like spheres happening, one of contraction or kind of like attention and one of letting go of control. I don't know if it touches base with your question. <laughs> very much, very much. I would uh, even respond to that and uh, I would say, no, it requires a lot and at the same time it requires nothing. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's this uh, Zen-like paradox. And I even think mm. we, did not, we, did, we did not speak about the grandfather of dialogue, which is Martin Buber, but Martin Buber, as a Jewish-German author. <laughs> yes. yes, and exactly this book, what you're holding, I miss very much. I need to buy another copy because I gave it as a gift. Uh, and uh, the Breno was just uh, showing the 
Tales of the Hasidim. And I, exactly, I, I, I am thinking of this book. I, I, I gave it to you as a gift. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. really funny. <laughs> That's why I don't have it anymore. <laughs> Give it back wow. to me. I want it. <laughs> My God. When's yeah. your birthday? <laughs> uh, so, yes, and I think That's I funny. think this actually this is describe <laughs> this is art. This 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 um, this suspension of these. Of the paradox, the suspension of the different, of the different forces, that does not mean a compromise. It's not in the middle. No, it is not in the middle between letting go and whatever. No, it is not. It is at the same time, <laughs> or dancing, or dancing around with these extremes. So it's not a balance in the sense that we stand on two foot in the in the center. No, comfortable. It is uh, what we call in our in the theater anthropology. It's a luxury balance. It's a balance in this balance. It's a balance. It's a dance actually. This notion of dance, I think, allow, allows us to 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 embrace uh, uh, contradictory impulses, which we need to which we need to have. <laughs> and uh, one his one story of the Hasidim of Martin Buba comes to my mind, where a, where a Jew needs to blow the the the, the sacred horn or the the religious horn for the for one of the for the um, uh, for the service, no, for the service of for the Jewish service. I don't know what this name of the horn is, but it's a special horn. And uh, this Jew prepares a lot. Now he really really prepares and really, I don't know, uh, gets into, prepares his mind and his body. And then the rabbi comes and he says, you idiot, just blow the horn. <laughs> and these, um, so, <laughs> in, in a story, in a joke, we can suspend these different, um, these different forces that... <laughs> Somehow, uh, we need to be able to, to, to master. We need to be able to, to hold to some kind of quality, to some rigor. And at the same time, in the other right moment, we need to let go. That is uh, very difficult. <laughs> hmm. I, I, I think also... Um, it, just blow the horn. There's some rules, some form, and we do it, and then we're doing it. And like with music, you play the tune or you improvise, and yeah, one is better than the you know makes has more energy maybe, or but but also you can't really say this was better or worse or. Doesn't really. It kind of escapes that notion of value judgment, uh, as if it were, um, you know, something actually to be said about that. And yet, at the same time, we do feel when we improvise a long time. Uh, yeah, this one spoke to me more than the other, or I was more engaged now. But that doesn't mean that we're not improvising, even when you are maybe thinking that you were failing still uh, improvisation happened and because you were doing it you're, you're doing the form and that's very much how i see the dialogues it it's not so much that you have to achieve it you have to do it um and uh, um Mm, there was something else. It will come. <laughs> if we have time. <laughs> yeah, I think it's very much about doing, Mariah. I think it's, um, it's about practice and it's about doing. And um, there is a notion also Bohm brings in, in, in his book that is, you know, like there is notions of, 
democracy and notions of circle talk where um it's almost like um the the goal is to come to um consensus it's that mm. everybody agrees to something um and and dialogue is can be uh, misinterpreted as that but i don't see it as a tool to to, to create consensus it's um it's he so bohm says it's it's not about um it's not about making common but it's about making in common this is what he says so it's actually mm. the the focus is shifted from the common to the making so it's really about doing it's about making in common to other people so in together with other people making something so doing is very mm. much alive in the sense that i see in um in uh, in in dialogue and um another notion i think simon brought up is suspension and i think we can talk <laughs> further and further about this but uh, it's it's another notion that is very very present in dialogue and i think it's one that <sighs> requires a lot um as 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 bohm puts it and i have some trouble with it as well sometimes and i'm 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 practicing and practicing more because the suspension how he says it's how can we really put our personal stories opinions our personal baggage so to say aside we suspend them and we don't throw them away but we suspend them and then underneath something else can happen with other people and um how can we actually do that how can i listen to someone who for example i don't know has a complete no no a subject uh, now he's oh. back now he's back that has a complete you were you were in the you were just saying that it has a complete and then we <laughs> how can i listen to someone who has a complete Oh my god, it's it the was smart filter. Again, again, it was again. It is at the in the same moment. We don't hear you now. Exactly same moment. Maybe it was too That's loud scary. or something. I think he was too smart. I hope he pressed record. Too clever. <laughs> uh I don't know what to do. It's the same as last. So do the same thing that you did last time <laughs> to solve this. <laughs> we check. Incoming call. Hello, hello. <laughs> hello, now. Now, yes, you're back. Ah, yes. There and there's are. echo again, so you need to uh, <laughs> to uh, check uh, change check, the uh, change the that you have the right output and, and press record again. Yes. Now, uh, yeah, always record. Yes, right. So maybe uh, still maybe, a bit echo. maybe you can rephrase what you were saying a little bit. Carefully. <laughs> Carefully. This, I think it was exploding. I'll do my best. So basically, uh, gathering my, th my thoughts together, I was speaking about <laughs> suspension. That's it. So <laughs> suspension yeah. and what does it actually mean? And, and that is actually one of the harder skills to really master in dialogue. Mm. And, um, and, and how can I really listen to someone else who has a completely different now we went through completely different um understanding of uh, a very specific point you know a very specific uh, virtual that is very dear to my understanding of life you know how can i listen to that person without not allowing myself to listen. How can I truly listen to what this person has to say without needing to defend myself? Um, um, so this is with this suspension skill um, in dialogue mm -hmm. that um, I think our times need it a lot. 
There is a lot of this skill needed in our times today. If we look at the world and how, I don't know, I just look at Brazil, where I grew up and the political situation there in the United States, in many countries in Europe, like how this um, polarization of ideology um, and, and the whole of society, uh, it creates uh, a sphere of, um, yeah, fight. Um, mm. There is, there is desperately, is desperately needed um, this quality of suspension that is actually connected to listening. It's uh, it's very interesting uh, uh, that the suspension and this holding back of the personal, it it does not mean that you cannot put very personal things in there, right? It means something like don't uh, invest that. Don't have, take this collective process to answer to your personal need in a direct way. In an indirect way, yes, it can, because it will feed you, it will nourish you, it will give you new ideas, maybe. But with the collective prose thing that is going on has its own uh, velocity. And to be able to accept that it might pass by, uh, you know, some point that is dear to you, is is uh, is really difficult at the same time you must be so attached to your heart as was said before that that this very special thing that only you could bring in because you are you and you are there and you are present that it does actually arrive and to me the the dialogue in actions as uh, in in practices as we do in the cross pollination group i mentioned in the beginning it makes this process very, very clear and maybe, a, in a way, good to practice this suspension because you can very clearly see the dialogue that is moving through, through uh, the space, uh, calling out, speaking to different parts of your practice, which is not so attached to what is my opinion, right? It's something that, that I, I can really, as easily accept that tap dancing is now not needed as that when yes tap dancing now is called for and i can give this very specific uh add this element that you know is is spoken to somehow by the collective process and make a very good distinction between what i am learning as a tap dancer is not what the collective process is about this collective thing that has its own uh, life I'm learning also, but I'm also feeding this beast with this uh, many uh, faceted life that is in the middle. And so all of the colleagues also are having their own process, maybe learning something. And sometimes you see someone suddenly break into a huge smile and you know, ah, someone has had a very significant insight, but they might not share it because... Yeah, that would disrupt the collective process, actually, what was going on. I like that image very much, uh, Mariah, of this uh, monster, how you say, but this uh, collective, uh, the, the collectiveness becoming, getting its own life, you know, and, and being alive. Yeah. And I think, yeah, that's... Uh, that's enabled uh, with uh, dialogical practices. I think there's there's one more thing I would love to uh, respond to uh, Simon um, on this. Why do it? You know, why can I? Why? And I don't know exactly if you said that, but that's somehow it came to my mind. Like this question, like. Uh, when you do a normal discussion or are you achieving dialogue or, and I think that, that actually there is something really interesting that if you need to make a, a decision, <laughs> you know, with your, uh, the, the community you live in a house, for instance, if you would have to uh, buy maybe a new chair or a new couch, maybe dialogue would not be the best form to actually decide uh, whether or not to, 
maybe you could have a dialogue and then have like another process to decide hey, like deep democracy or uh, community um that yeah i don't think dialogue is necessarily the answer to every single process you know it's uh, it's one specific thing that that i engage in not because it makes me feel good or warm or fuzzy but because it gives me an enormous inspiration like literally inspiration that connecting to the quaker <laughs> the quaker sense of uh being inspired like it gives me so much input like food i and and uh, but in a way that that is not determining like a, but but allows for this uh, serendipity and oracular stuff to happen i think one yes i agree and i think one has to kind of stress the uselessness of dialogue Yeah, in the sense, absolutely. and this is also very. I think we spoke the last time also when we were speaking about Artaud, theater of cruelty. When I was having my little rant situation of, when I said that theater is also not is also useless in this sense. It is not a. It's not a tool to activate your creativity so that you can afterwards uh, make better investment funds or something or come or uh, as dialogue i suppose is not a tool or would be misused as a tool to find yeah as i said a, a better strategy for my hotel business with my team it can be some form of training some form of training of because Breno was saying before the su suspending your own baggage of opinions and of thoughts and of what you would consider your persona no your also your public persona maybe um, which is different from speaking from the heart because the heart would be more would be <laughs> As another part in yourself which is maybe not your public persona not your public person but to be able to suspend this I first I need to be able to perceive it also I need to be able to perceive that when we speak I normally I normally have a an automatic train of thought in my head that is spinning and already all the time um, trying to answer, to bring my point, to bring my opinion. And this is something very strong to, uh, to be able to experience in this form of dialogue, to be able to experience, to see the train or the, the running of your thoughts that go all the time, uh, want to respond, want to bring your point. So the uselessness of dialogue, it's not about the content, but about perceiving this process of thought and also maybe the things that happen in, in this process of thought, not things that, that uh, happens to the thought. Yeah, and this is uh, also a, a, a paradox. And um, one question maybe that for me would arise from that is that um, how do you... For instance, how do you deal with that when you make this project with the Goethe Institute, for instance? Because on the one hand, the dialogue is just a dialogue and does not have any, does not solve any problem. On the other hand, you said, and we say, I also say, we need dialogue because we need to solve problems. No? Bohm puts it very uh, straightforward that it's it's very important for dialogue in this sense to take place that there is not a um, exact um, outcome required there is not like something that needs to be there in the end yeah and this is lifting exactly this pressure that we put in the beginning 
Yeah. And, and this space that opens up, yeah, without that pressure, it's very precious. It's a very precious space. Um, because it's, it's, it's an honest space. It's a space exactly where we are allowed to connect to our hearts. And our hearts, they are incredibly powerful. It's very, very powerful when we speak from the heart. And... Um, Yeah, this sense of honesty and this sense of uh, truthfulness to oneself huh, is um, is is what um, yeah it so brings authenticity to to a dialogue process. And uh, speaking of like a project like the one we did with the Goethe Institute for for solid dialogues. Um, it's it's very clear there that there is there is no precise outcome required and this was agreed from the beginning and the feedback we got from people was that they were so relieved they were so relieved of not having that outcome required and um what was generated in that so were blocks of 1 hour um and we had 30 of them so Simon was part was part of one of these 30 blocks. And um and people from different corners in the world met. They didn't have met, they had never met before, and they met for this one hour session and they were invited into dialogue. And what took place in that 60 minutes is yeah, I would say it's quite special. Um how it happens what is said, how the interaction takes place, what is generated in that 60-minute conversation. And, um, yeah, a level of connection also happens where people, first of all, feel connected to themselves and this allows them to connect to others and... Uh, this connection with the with the group is um, yeah very, just very very needed, and uh, in the context of Goethe, they were they were interested in that. They were interested in how to um, how can we bring people together with different views, people from different contexts, from different countries, potentially with different ideologies how can we bring them together and have them connecting somehow so this is mm. this was the exercise there I, I would like to respond quickly because i know we are out of time but uh uh but it it it's you know it's, it's, talking about the usefulness of or the or the its usefulness as a to tool or problem solving uh, it, it's almost like going a, a bit beside the point in the in the sense that the critical um, mind is what we all value in problem solving right so you have to be very intelligent critical and and then we'll get to the point and solve this fucking problem um, which is very dis it can be very, very productive in a discussion or a debate or, or when you are doing so. But for the creation of development of new ideas or the uh, creation of new connections, openness to what is emerging, insights that are outside of your own uh, existing frame of understanding, your own speciality maybe, specialism, your own knowledge, a critical mind is not always the best thing, uh, uh, especially when it is trained and honed to function in a debate or in a in a uh, academic also uh, critical um, surroundings or ways of thought. It's almost like the the forms that our thought processes are 
trained to take, as you already mentioned in the beginning, uh, uh, Breno. And I think that is where, if you have to say, is a dialogue useful, it, that is where it's very useful. That is where it even could be said as a good training ground or a good tool to develop these skills of um, uh, allowing creative thought to happen. And we are also on the topic of when does creativity happen, right? Which is a lovely <laughs> serendipity that it brings us all the way back to the beginning. <laughs> and um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a lovely circle coming back to, to creativity. And um, yeah, I think, you know, like creativity, when I just observe it, it's it comes in these moments where it's not really required, you know, it just happens. And some of it is useful. Some of it is, is, is not so useful, but I believe like taking the pressure away of bringing that creativity about um, is what it really makes space for this, this newness, these insights to come about. And some of them will be so useful that they will change entire things because they're not connected to something that was there before. They are new. Yeah. Yeah. And they are new coming from the space where different things meet. The things that are in essence different. This is this in common, the uncommon that is being uh, uh, founded. And uh, I guess, you know, what, here's where for me the paradox lies. Like in jazz, you know, it is a tool in a way, a form which almost certainly will bring something new to the... And in that sense, even though there's no pressure to... to uh, you know, the, the expected outcome is that something will emerge. You just don't know what. And I think that's, that's really uh, so contrary to what, how we are used to thinking of productive forms or productive tools or productive ways of working. And yet, time and time again, there's a lot of uh, examples of communities or gatherings or laboratories where this kind of non-pressurized, highly diverse <laughs> work that, that has a certain aspect of dialogue uh, was, was being done with extremely productive outcomes. And Bohm's, uh, uh, not, not Bohm, um, Bohr's <laughs> laboratory might be seen as one example. Also, the Philips laboratory from the 40s up to the 70s, I guess, where this is a really funny thing that this, this uh, highly trained specialist were put in this laboratory and they were allowed to do anything but their speciality. So they were allowed to do any kind of research except what was in the direct line of their um, their training, <laughs> which it it is uh, speaking to this uh, cutting off from your personal, uh, leaving behind your personal. It's it's speaking to um, something else that was said that escapes me right now. Oh yeah, the non-productiveness, the non-pressure, the non-pressure not to, uh, you know, become uh, more specialized. Or, no, that's not it. The non-pressure, the non-pressure, the non-productive, being highly productive. Sorry, now I'm getting to rambling phase. I think <laughs> I think I, I'm ready to to knit an end to this uh, <laughs> dialogue. <laughs> So the end is whenever we want it to end. Um, I feel like, I don't know, I'm um, confused if I'm supposed to end the session or is one of you? <laughs> well, or we do it collectively? We have a tune. <laughs> Let's do it collectively. <laughs> 
on three, I think okay. I th on three, yeah. It's, it's not impossible. We have latency, so it would be very funny. And what should we do on three? Should we hit the gong or should we say stop? Or should we say no? Breno, you just, you're the master of ceremony of the dialogue and Mariah and me, we are the podcast. So we close the dialogue, then we close the podcast. It's, it's so simple. Perfect. <laughs> just do it. <laughs> Shut up and just do it. <laughs> or so I, I officially I close. <laughs> <laughs> I officially close our dialogue session. Oh, we need some music. Now. Oh. I don't agree with that. No. Oh, yeah. I don't <laughs> agree. To, this was too fast. Or maybe we just do like one last round. Let's do like this. <laughs> Things. If you haven't said anything <laughs> that uh, you would like to bring very much right now, this is the space. Can be a laughter. Can be anything you like. Um, and then we close it. I've actually always wanted to be in a Bohemian dialogue. You want you you Thank did you you yeah, did. No. Well, not the, yeah. Now I did. Yeah. Now I did. Now you you did. Yeah. I guess. Yeah, I guess too. I don't know. I think I don't know. You, did we achieve? You were cut for a moment. Did you? What, did, what was the <laughs> verb? Can you repeat, Mariah? Uh, which which verb? <laughs> Sorry. Oh, what did you say? Hey, did, you were did, cut for me. Oh, what did you say, Mariah? I I, I said I I always have wanted to be in an official Bohemian dialogue. In a what? Official Bohemian dialogue <laughs> ah you know with a legitimate stamp <laughs> thank you breno yes thank you breno yes you're I, very welcome i agree with mariah i also it was the dream of my life <laughs> now, it's, now it achieved everything You've already been in a Bohemian dialogue before, Zeman. Yes. I was in one with you. Ah, fuck. Uh, yeah, sorry. Okay, so I changed it. I, the dream was to be twice. No, more times. <laughs> okay, I think we're already in the after bar session. Thanks, Breno, very much. <laughs> very, very, very um, grateful for the opportunity and the invitation to talk to you. Uh, to get to know Mariah. I was very pleased. Lovely to meet you. And, Likewise, um, lovely to meet you. And very, very nice to reconnect with my old friend Simon. I have many memories from Witten and it's nice to reconnect. Yeah. So this was the White Room number 30 and I thank you and I thank all the listeners who are listening now or whenever you are listening to this. Today it was a special episode with, which was uh, non-theatrical or was it theatrical? We don't know. Maybe it had something to do. Maybe not. For me, I hope, I mean, it is a performance. Dialogue, it, it is a performance in the sense, in a very, very simple sense, Aristotelian sense, it has a beginning and a development and an end. And it is performing. So the only thing that is different and, or that I don't know and you, listener, have to judge if this was actually a pleasing performance or if it was... Uh, uh, oh, or if the, or yes. if the performance And who was sucked. your favorite character? And who was, yeah. <laughs> who was your exactly. favorite character? <laughs> write, it in, write it in the comments. And, Feel and, free to throw <laughs> some tomatoes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, write in the comments um, uh, if you liked me. And if you did not, then... Not and yeah, so <laughs> you. Can, uh, I really don't know. I'm I'm so unprofessional. Podcast. I hate this. You know, I really hate this. But you can uh, join us again in the next <laughs> podcast. <laughs> and um, actually, you can support us by writing us comments. So comment and. Um, Subscribe to the podcast. This would really help. 
and recommend us to your friends. And what what is the what is the next uh, episodes about, Mariah? Do we have any? Oh my God! Do we have any view into the future? No, we don't have. The future is. Let's do. Foggy, foggy. Let's do one together. We do a <laughs> no. duo podcast next time. Really? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It's Let's a do. promise. <laughs> No, seriously, thank you very much. Goodbye, Mariah. Goodbye, Brenda. Thanks. And see you next time. Goodbye. Ciao. Thank you very much. You could say it requires a lot and at the same time it requires nothing. <laughs>